The Trump administration announced yesterday that it will give $1.8 billion in grant funding to opioid addiction treatment and prevention efforts. More than 130 people in the U.S. die each day after overdosing on opioids, and many hold Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, responsible for much of the crisis. Now, just last week, Purdue offered to settle more than 2,000 lawsuits against them for 10 to $12 billion. Dasha Burns chatted with a former Purdue sales rep about her time with the company and the sales tactics they use to promote their drugs to doctors. How would you characterize your five years as a sales representative at Purdue Pharma? When I started in 2008, that was after the first big lawsuit uh, had been settled. And so we still were dealing with the aftermath of the negative publicity and pushback against the company. And it, that, was, that was tough to, um, to deal with. It was, a, it was a, a bit of a tough sell. And they hired myself and a um, hundred other plus sales reps over the course of a year or so to expand their marketing into family practices and general practices. And so what they did was they carved out smaller territories in order to be able to get coverage into those offices. And um, that was, that was tough because in retrospect, you know, you wonder if, a family doctor should really even be prescribing Oxycontin. The theory there was, okay, you can go into a family practice and, and ask the doctor to start a patient on 10 milligrams. If everything else that they had been on had failed to manage their pain, this would be the first opioid that they would, would be on. And it sounds like it would be logical, but it was still a bit of a tough sell to get the doctor to, to hurdle, to jump that hurdle from something like, let's say, tramadol to oxycodone. A lot of doctors, especially family doctors, general practitioners, had apprehension about opioids and about oxycontin, and they were concerned about the addictive nature of the medication. So when, when doctors did have concerns, how were you trained to ad ad address those? How were you trained to, to, to get them to buy? Well, as a salesperson, you're trained to know that an objection is a buying signal. So if the doctor has an objection, then that gives you the opportunity to overcome that objection and therefore remove any obstacle to their buying, quote unquote, or prescribing what you're presenting. We had some sales pieces that we were given. Uh, one of them addressed the difference between true addiction and physical dependence and tolerance, and then what the company called pseudo addiction. And that's a word that's been written about a lot. That's sort of that 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 keyword that a lot of folks had a problem with. Can you can you explain to me what what did the company describe as as pseudo addiction? Well, theoretically pseudo addiction was supposed to be if a patient displayed drug seeking behavior that was similar to what you might see in an addict. In, a, in other words, they would go to the doctor and say um, the dose that you gave me isn't isn't strong enough. It's not it's not managing my pain. Or they may go to several different doctors to try to get you know, uh, more medication. We were trained to ask the doctor or to consider the possibility that it might be pseudo addiction, which would mean that that's a patient whose pain is being undertreated. And so the solution there is to try prescribing a higher dosing strength. And once the patient's pain is sufficiently controlled, or sufficiently managed, those behaviors should cease. So the solution to pseudo addiction was more of the drug. Yes. yes. Were there, was there any science to back up this idea of pseudo addiction? No. I mean, we had a, we had a marketing piece that was given to us that was approved by the marketing department. And when you get something from the marketing department, you assume that it's legitimate because you know that it had to go through approval in the legal department and everything else. So at what point did you start to think, hey, there might be something wrong with what we're doing here? I would say it was more toward the end of my time there, and, and that was one of the things that kind of pushed me over the edge to leave. But while I was there, I had um, a couple of pharmacies in my territory that were robbed at gunpoint, and the robber had come in and specifically asked for Oxycontin. Um, there was more and more bad press 
as far as, you know, people overdosing. There are people who say that Purdue not only contributed to the opioid epidemic, but they, in fact, credit Purdue Pharma with, with starting it. How do you feel about that? I think they definitely contributed to it. Um, in retrospect now, I think that they were much more aware of what was going on. I think they knew that they were, they were mismarketing it and they continue to do so anyway because it really was all about profit. And I remember being instructed, oddly enough, to never refer to Oxycontin as Oxy because that's what it was called on the street. That we, even in our call notes, had to spell out Oxycontin and always refer to it that way. So there was an undercurrent that they knew, they were well aware of what was going on. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.